Can you all hear me okay? Okay, so I should start by saying that I'm not a structural biologist. I'm a, a protein nucleic acid biochemist by training. So I'd like to thank the organizers for what's been a really fantastic learning opportunity for myself over the past few days. So everything I'm gonna talk about today has been the result of a really great collaboration uh, between myself uh, and the lab of another biochemist, Joe Yields at the LMB in Cambridge. Uh, and two really great uh, structural biologists who are based in Joe's lab, Michael Jenkin Bedford and Morgan Jones. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about today is, uh, is our attempts over the past couple of years to use single particle cryoelectron microscopy to, to interrogate the mechanisms of one of the most fundamental issues, I think, in all biology, which is the mechanisms that cells use to replicate their chromosomes to allow their genetic information to be passed on during cell division. So just some numbers here, uh, we all know that in human cells, we've got four, six of these chromosomes. Each one of them averages uh, about five centimeters of DNA. So a, a quick bit of simple math, we can say that we have to replicate over two meters of DNA every single time a cell divides. So the scale of this task is really quite incredible. So the basics of, of this process of how we go about replicating all this DNA, and we all learn this uh, at high school probably now, maybe at undergraduate, is that we have to unwind parental double-stranded DNA here, and this provides a single-stranded DNA templates upon which the replicative polymerases can then act. So this creates a few basic enzymatic requirements for this process to occur. We need a DNA helicase here to unwind the double-stranded DNA, and then we need leading and lagging strand DNA polymerases to synthesize the new strands. So that's the basics, but of course it's biology, so it's a bit more complicated than that. And we know that, of course, in eukaryotes, this process of, of chromosome replication is actually much more than just making a new copy of the DNA. The DNA we know it is wrapped many times around these histone proteins to form chromatin. The, the histone proteins themselves carry uh, information in the form of epigenetic marks. So, so these have to be faithfully passed uh, to the newly replicated DNA during replication. We also have to establish cohesion between these uh, replicated uh, DNAs. And we think that's done by passing these large cohesion rings uh, at the replication fork. And finally, the, the replication fork also has to coordinate the recognition and, and subsequent repair uh, of numerous different forms of DNA damage. So in part driven by the inherent complexity of this process, actually the eukaryotic replication machinery, we call the reposome, it actually evolved to be much more complex than just these simple helicase and polymerase modules and actually contains a whole range of, of different enzymatic activities uh, as well as some accessory proteins. So I guess all this is just to say that the, the molecular machine that I'm going to talk about today is, is very big, over two megadaltons, and it's very complex. It contains a ra this range of different enzymatic activities. But there's only really one unit of this molecular machine that you need to focus on today, and that's this CMG replicative helicase, which sits at the core of the reposome and performs this essential task of unwinding parental double-stranded DNA to generate those single-strand DNA templates upon which replicative polymerases can act. Okay, so CMG is an 11 subunit complex, CDC45, this GINS tetramer, and these six related AAA plus ATPases is called the MCM2 to 7 proteins. So these MCM2 to 7 proteins come together and form this heterohexameric ring-shaped complex that really forms the uh, ATPase motor of CMG. And a critical mechanistic point to appreciate here is that the way in which the MCM topologically entraps a single strand of DNA allows CMG to unwind DNA via a simple steric exclusion mechanism. So you can see here in this cartoon, it's bound around that leading strand DNA template and excluding the lagging strand template from its central channel. That's how it unwinds DNA. Okay, so one of the reasons CMG has been so interesting to the replication field for so long now and increasingly interesting to structural biologists as well is because it's really via CMG that all the regulation of DNA replication goes. So it's been long established that when you initiate replication at the start of rep DNA replication in S phase, the key regulated step here is the assembly of these pairs of divergent CMG helicases of replication origin. 
So I won't go into the details of this today, but uh, I'd just like to highlight that driven by the field's capacity to reconstitute this process using purified proteins in vitro uh, and use cryo-EM to image reaction intermediates, we're now increasingly getting uh, a really a molecular level understanding of this step of replication. So in reality, replication initiates at multiple distinct sites, replication origins positioned throughout uh, eukaryotic chromosomes, and replication will then continue until two of these replosomes uh, converge and meet one another, or, or a single replosome reaches the end of a linear chromosome. And at that point, replication terminates. And what's clear now is that actually when replication terminates, the converse is true to initiation. So in initiation, as I said, the key step is CMG assembly. And at termination, whether that's when two replosomes meet one another, or when we reach a chromosome end, it's actually CMG disassembly that's the key regulated step. Okay, so the disassembly reaction occurs in two stages. In the first stage, there's some unique signal that's specific to the end of replication, and that triggers a polyubiquitylation of a single subunit of CMG, this MCM7 subunit, and this is driven by a Cullen ring type E3 ubiquitin ligase complex. And in the second step, this ubiquitylated CMG is then disassembled, and this is driven by another hexameric AAA plus ATPase, this CDC48 complex. Okay, so an important enzyme for, for today's talk is these, uh, the, the E3 ubiquitin ligase, so the architecture of them is thus. In yeast, uh, the enzyme is called SCF diet 2. It has this substrate binding uh, subunit diet 2, this long Cullen scaffold, and at the C-terminal end of the Cullen, there's this HRT1 protein, which is where the E2 and ubiquitin will bind. And I'd just like to highlight that unusually in, in DNA replication biology, uh, which generally is quite well conserved between yeast and humans, uh, it seems that the identity of these E3 ubiquitin ligase is actually different. So uh, as I said, in yeast, we use an enzyme called SCF dia 2 to drive this ubiquitylation event, whereas in metazoans, they use an apparently unrelated uh, culling ring E3 ubiquitin ligase, which is called cul 2 lr one Okay, so the key question uh, relating to this process that the field has been interested in for some years now has been trying to understand how this ubiquitylation event is regulated, because really what we want to do here is always ubiquitylate and disassemble the replosome when replication finishes, but never do that prematurely while replication is ongoing, because that would be a a bit of a disaster for the cell, let's say. You'd probably leave a portion of the genome unreplicated, and that would have, obviously, profoundly deleterious effects on, on genome stability. So really, this is an issue of, of molecular recognition, right? How does the E3 ubiquitin ligase recognize this type of, of CMG and ubiquitylate it, but not touch this type of CMG before termination? So I'll just highlight here that there's a key difference in the way in which the CMG is interacting with the DNA before and after termination. Okay, so during replication, as I mentioned, it, the CMG is topologically bound around that single strand of DNA uh, and excluding the other strand from its central channel, where after these two things pass one another, CMG is just bound around double-stranded DNA. And actually, biochemical work, if we go back a couple of years, the biochemical work had indicated that actually this excluded strand of DNA, which is present at all active, Replosomes, but uh, disappears upon termination, were the thing that were suppressing ubiquitylation before termination. Uh, and this was shown by myself for the yeast enzymes, but by uh, Johannes Walters Lab at Harvard Medical School also for the metazoan proteins. What was completely unclear here was what the really underlying molecular and structural basis was for this regulation, or indeed if, if a common mechanism were used for these apparently unrelated proteins in yeast and metazoans. Okay, so thanks for your patience. Now for some structural biology, which is what I'm here to, to talk about. So over the past two years, we've been trying to use single particle cryoelectron microscopy in collaboration with Joe's lab to really, really try and answer the two questions that I highlighted on the previous slide. So our aim was really to try and solve the structure of a, of a terminated yeast replosome complex. So this is going to be a CMG with all the replosome proteins bound and this E3 ubiquitin ligase associated uh, bound around double-stranded DNA. So the biochemistry is quite challenging here. We're trying to uh, reconstitute from individually purified proteins uh, 26 subunit complex. Um, uh, 
But we can do that. We, we mix CMG with these purified reposome proteins and E3 ubiquitin ligase with this DNA substrate depicted here. We modify uh, the, the backbone of the DNA to hopefully trap uh, DNA around that double-stranded DNA region. I should say that the association of some of these proteins with CMG is, is quite dynamic. Uh, so we, we do graphics gradient fixation to stabilize the complex. And after the, the glycerol gradient, you can see that we can reconstitute a, a nice stoichiometric complex. I've highlighted in pink there the, the E3 ligase subunits that we're interested in. So we could get this complex onto grids without too much trouble. Uh, and even from the first 2D class averages, we started to see some elements of secondary structure appearing. So this was quite promising. Fast forward uh, a lot of work from Michael, uh, a lot of it done during the first phase of, of the pandemic. Uh, and he, he had to work quite hard on the data processing here. He, he did a lot of, uh, he generated multiple maps, each of which involved signal subtraction and, and, and 3D classification focused on certain areas of the map. And then these maps were combined to, to, to make the composite map that I'm showing you here. Um, but we were able to, to solve the structure of, of this terminated yeast reposome complex. So the key thing that I'm going to focus on for today is the pink density at the top of the map as you look at it, and that's the E3 ubiquitin ligase that we're interested in. So you can probably appreciate that the resolution in this region of, of the map does vary somewhat. Uh, we saw that the, that long Cullen subunit, CDC53, was at quite low resolution. And we think that's due to um, flexibility in that region of the structure. You can see here where we compare in different 3D classes, we can see that that, that culling arm, as we call it, is, is, is quite flexible. But in any case, the, the C-terminal end of the culling is in quite a nice position to mediate ubiquitin transfer onto uh, that MCM7 subunit. The substrate binding protein in this complex uh, is at much higher resolution. So much so that Michael was able to, the, for the first time, to build a, a atomic structure of the majority of this protein. And this was predominantly made up of this spiral shape of leucine rich repeats, 15 leucine rich repeats here. What Michael actually saw was that these leucine rich repeats of dia 2 were binding directly onto the CMG complex across these MCM3 and 5 zinc fingers with a small contribution from the MCM7 uh, N terminus. Okay, so this was really speaking to how this E3 ubiquitin ligase was engaging the reposome when replication terminates here and we end up with CMG bound on double stranded DNA. But we were interested whether the same uh, recruitment mechanism took place when, when replication finishes at chromosome ends and we get CMG ending up just off DNA. So we repeated our cryomm experiment now in the complete absence of DNA. Uh, and the map we were able to generate is not quite as nice. The absence of DNA does destabilize some of, some of the association of some of our reposome proteins. But I hope you can appreciate that this spiral of di 2 leucine rich repeats is binding in the same position on the reposome across those MCM3 and 5 subunits, whether we're off DNA or whether we're bound to double-stranded DNA. Okay, so the resolution in, in this region of our double-stranded DNA structure was sufficiently high that we could identify uh, key amino acid contacts here that I've highlighted in yellow. We could then purify uh, mutants in, in this region as tetrameric uh, E3 ubiquitin ligases. And using quite a, a complex biochemical assay where we can essentially reconstitute replication termination in vitro using purified proteins, we could uh, assess the functional requirements for, for this interaction, which I should say had not been described or using any type of biochemical or structural assay. So what you can see here is that when we mutate this interface, we get this profound defect in, in MCM7 ubiquitation upon replication termination, and particularly with this 13A mutant of dia 2 where all these yellow residues are mutated, we really get uh, a protein that's almost dead for, for ubiquitation. So we could confirm this uh, functional in vitro observation using uh, in vivo assays that I won't go into today. Suffice to say that also genetically, if we just uh, do an allelic replacement in, in, in budding yeast, we recapitulate the dia 2 loss of function phenotype with this dia 2 13 a mutant. So as you see here, this profound growth defect. 
Okay, so this was the, the situation with the yeast proteins. And as I said, generally speaking, yeast is a, is a very good model in, in the DNA replication world for how things work in, in high eukaryotes. So every one of the uh, yeast reposome proteins that I've spoken about and showed structures of today has a single homologue or functional orthologue in, in the human reposome. But unusually, in, in this one aspect of DNA replication, uh, replication termination and reposome disassembly, actually, the identity of this E3 ubiquitin ligase is different. So we worked quite closely with some um, bioinformaticians uh, at the Human Genetics Unit in Edinburgh, and they were not able to detect any sequence conservation between these dia 2 and LR1 subunits, for, for example. What was even more intriguing, though, was that the biochemistry said that both of these E3 ubiquitin ligases was negatively regulated by the same mechanism involving this, this excluded DNA strand. So we wanted to try and tackle this again using a cryo-EM approach. So this was building on some work that was unpublished at the time in Joe's lab, essentially using a very analogous approach to that which we used for the yeast reposome structures. Uh, Joe and Morgan could reconstitute a human reposome E3 ubiquitin ligase complex. So as I said, the, the approach is very similar using individually purified reposome proteins and this CUL2 LR1 E3 ubiquitin ligase and purifying the complex over a graphics gradient. Could reconstitute this uh, nice stoichiometric uh, multi-subunit complex. And Morgan was able to generate this, this very nice cryo-EM map. Okay, so again, as you look at it, the E3 ubiquitin ligase is bound on the top of the, of the CMG. And again, you can probably appreciate that the resolution in this region of the map does vary somewhat. So again, the Cullen subunit is quite low resolution. Again, when we compare different 3D classes, we see quite a bit of flexibility in this region of the map. Uh, we think actually that might be functionally important because one thing I haven't highlighted is that to trigger the assembly reaction, you actually need to build a long poly ubiquitin chain onto MCM7. So we think that that movement of the cullin arm might be important for building a long chain over five ubiquitins in length. But in any case, again, we saw that the C-terminal end of the cullin subunit were in a, in a really perfect position to mediate ubiquitin transfer onto MCM7. Again, the substrate binding domain protein of, of the E3 ubiquitin ligase was a much higher resolution, and Morgan was able to build almost a complete atomic model uh, for this LRR1 protein. At the N terminus, there was this plextrin homology domain, and at the C terminus, there were these nine leucine rich repeats, which were binding directly down onto those MCM3 and 5 subunits of CMG. So if you haven't noticed, there's something quite interesting going on here, which is despite being unrelated in sequence and also in structure, the leucine-rich repeats of the, the yeast dia 2 protein and, and the human LR1 protein are both binding to an identical region of the reposome across those MCM3 and 5 uh, zinc finger domains. So we think this must be reflective of some sort of convergent evolution. Okay, so what does any of this mean for the question of, of regulation that I highlighted in the introduction? Well, what we can say is that there's no conformational change that we can detect upon termination. So if we just overlay our, our terminated reposome structures with, with an active reposome that is bound at a replication fork structure, you can see there's really no conformational change now at that E3 ligase uh, reposome interface. I guess the key thing really from the regulatory perspective was we needed to understand where this excluded strand of DNA was going, which is, what, as I've said, what the biochemistry was telling us was the key, key aspects of the replication fork. So it sounds like it's quite a simple question, but I think it's fair to say this has been quite intractable for the structural biologists in the, in the DNA replication field, probably in part just because this single strand of DNA is inherently a little bit flexible. So what I'm showing you here is, is two cryo-EM maps that Morgan generated. These uh, are, are two complexes that were prepared with an, in an identical fashion. The only difference is on the left, it's on a DNA substrate that doesn't have the excluded strand. Uh, and on the right, as you look at it, it's on a DNA substrate that has that excluded strand. So I hope you can appreciate that the only difference between these two maps is, is this region of pink density here, which is continuous with the base of the parental double-stranded DNA, 
uh, and exits CMG between the MCM3 and 5 subunits. So this is absent when we don't have an excluded strand present on our DNA substrate. So we think this is pretty good evidence that this is uh, the, the path of it, the excluded strand, how it exits the central channel of CMG. And I don't have the expertise in, in cryo-EM data processing to explain why this is, but it's definitely true that we were only able to see this weaker density when the data was refined with cryo-spark rather than rely on. Okay, so that's the path by which this excluded strand exits CMG. I want to just show this picture again and show you that's exactly where these leucine-rich repeat domains of dia 2 and LR1 bind. Hopefully, if you're still with me, the, the regulatory mechanism should, should present itself, which is simply to say that during active replication, the continuous pumping of a single strand of DNA through this channel between the MCM3 and 5 zinc fingers is just going to completely sterically block the engagement of these leucine-rich repeat domains onto CMG. And given that our functional data indicates that this interaction is, is critical for CMG ubiquitylation, both in vitro and in vivo, that's going to be sufficient to, to block ubiquitylation until that excluded strand of DNA is lost upon replication termination. And taken together, what these cryo-EM structures have really allowed us to do is present, I think, quite a, a simple, elegant model for, for a critical regulatory step of, of DNA replication. And I guess the take-home message here is really that there's only one key structural feature that changes before and after termination. And that's to say that, that during active replication, that LRR-MCM interaction is blocked by this excluded strand of DNA. But once you lose that excluded strand upon termination, that's going to be sufficient to trigger ubiquitylation and disassembly of only those replisomes that have completed replication. And, and we published this work uh, towards the end of last year. Okay, so I'm sure everyone wants to go home, so I'll leave it there. Um, I should just acknowledge... Uh, Fantastic collaborator, Joe Yields. I think I've mentioned the two people who were responsible for the microscopy, Michael and Morgan. I should thank my, my former boss, uh, Kareem Labib. He was gracious and supportive enough to allow me to, to, to do this project largely independently whilst I was finishing my postdoc in his lab. Some of the data collection was done in-house at LMB. Some of it was done at EBIC at Diamond. So thanks to both of those facilities for the data collection. Uh, and also thanks to my new home at the Human Genetics Unit as of six months ago where I started my lab. Uh, thanks to you for your attention and I'm happy to take questions if there are any. Thank you so much, Tom. Questions? Yes. Really nice talk. I had